This is the Outlier's Edge podcast, where we champion the leaders who are shaping the next era of humanity by taking them to the edge of their comfort zone so that they can lead us to the edge of what's next. I'm your host, Niyama Ashan. Let's do this. Hello there. And Niyama Shang here, founder of Outliers Edge, where we champion the leaders who are shaping the next era of humanity. Today, we get a chance to really explore one of those leaders joining here. I'm with Kaheka Shah Basu, and we're going to be able to spend some time focus on not just where she's been and not, not only where she is, but where she's going uh, up, uh, in the future. So Kaheka Shah, I am really just excited to be in this conversation with you here. How are you doing today? I'm doing really great. And I too am very excited to be speaking to you today. Yeah, it feels good. Um, I love to just read out a little bit of um, a little bio, a little snippet of, uh, of, some, of some of who you are. Um, so Kahekasha is an iconic youth leader, a global influencer, environmentalist, and champion of children's rights. She's a Forbes 30 under 30, a TEDx speaker, and climate reality mentor. In addition to being an author, a musician, a peace and sustainability campaigner, and a passionate advocate of women's rights. Kahekasha is a trailblazer who's been challenging the status quo and breaking social structures and taboos uh, for, for years. And she does it a lot through her organization, the Green Hope Foundation. Kahekasha, we are getting a sense of like who you are in terms of uh, some of the impacts that, that you have. And uh, there's actually quite a list of accomplishments that we can, that we can actually uh, read through. But I'm really curious the way that I'm curious about who like you are. So when you're not when you're not, um, and maybe yeah, when you're not trailblazing, uh, mm -hmm. and you're just and you're just living life, can you share a little bit about like about you, Kakasha? Yeah, well, it's funny you should ask that because you know a lot of times people have asked me like, what do you do outside of your work? And for me, Green Hope Foundation and taking care of people and planet, that's something that's just me. That is part of my life. So even if I am not out in the field doing the work, I am still conscious of everything that I do, showing empathy for people and planet. And I do credit that to the way I saw my parents, actually the way I was raised and how I grew up thinking that empathy for people and planet was normal, that every single person, uh, you know, had that love in that, their heart for their fellow human being, for their planet. And it was only, you know, just as I grew up that I realized that that was obviously not the case. Uh, but like now as uh, an adult, I still try to ensure that every single action that I take is just taking care of our people and planet. And for Green Hope Foundation, I founded it when I was so young. It is literally part of every single thing that I do. And I bring in all of my likes and dislikes also into uh, my work with Green Hope. So it's like, it's just part of who I am. And that is a part of my everyday life too. Yeah, you did found it when you were young. So I just, just so we can have that like in this space here, when, when was Green Hope Foundation uh, founded? Uh, I founded it when I was 12 years old. I started my journey in the field of sustainability when I was seven. And, and I mentioned that there are these moments that I had and I realized uh, that the world was, there was something wrong with our planet, really, with the way we treated each other, with the way we treated our planet. And when I was seven, I saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic, was deeply disturbed by that. That kind of prompted me to start my advocacy for people and planet. And then when I was 12, I was the youngest uh, delegate at the largest sustainable development conference of the time discussing a variety of uh, issues relating to, you know, solving our world's challenges. And I realized that there was this severe lack of inclusivity of children uh, in the sustainability process. And as I looked deeper, it, it really just spanned children, young people, people of color, women, uh, vulnerable marginalized communities, literally every single person, person who should be involved, but wasn't. So that is how I started Green Hope Foundation at 12, to using the experience that I had five, from five years prior to that, to really create a platform of learning that turns into grand level actions. Uh, this, um, 
I get excited for where we can take this conversation because you brought in a, a few you brought in a few different points. One of the things that we focus here on in Outliers Edge is like the um like who the person is as they are out created in the world, right? Um, so we're gonna like explore Green Hope Foundation. I want to like spend some time talking about some of like your like the projects, some of like the, your favorite projects and how you also think think about it as a leader and uh and organize around that. Um and you brought up something right now that I just wanted to start <laughs> to, to like lean into, which is um, the element of like how normal all of this was for you. Um, and uh, being in a space where it's like by age seven, you're like, it's like, this was just like, it's in the family unit. It's in the way you were, you were raised. Like, like we, we take care of people on the planet. Um, and through like, through that element of like just being it, it being normal there was there's a lot of other there's a lot of actions that that you took place and i just want to kind of just like just talk a little bit around like almost like normalizing these things that almost feel like um uh i don't know i think about like the words that come to my mind right now as i'm talking about this are like people are like well you have such extreme views or you're like you're being an advocate or like or you're being a radical like it's like it just doesn't need doesn't need it doesn't need as much and it almost seems like those those elements feel like they're at the fringes or at the edges of like what society mm -hmm. deems appropriate right now but for you that's not it like that just feels like it's just like it's just it's just normal so can you speak a little bit to that there i'd love to explore that today. for sure yeah and you're you're absolutely right that kind of sentiment of uh like this for me it's normal but for others it's not like i faced that throughout my life like i had my friends asking me like okay but why are you actually doing this like what are you what are you getting out of it and when i said that you know it's just that uh, you know being able to sleep at night satisfying my conscience th then they were like really because I, I don't get it. And I think that that is something that any person who wants to do good, wants to bring about change, that kind of resistance, I think uh, they're going to face no matter what, which is really sad because like, you know, just having love in your heart, having empathy, that's, that really should be normal. And for me, like I, as I said, I said, saw that in my family and I see that in my members at Green Hope Foundation, but yeah, definitely when we're trying to, you know, do good, when we're trying to bring about change, we are, for me as well, often looked at as people who are just, uh, you know, as you said, radical or, you know, trying to just push the boundaries, trying to do something that's uh, going against what is seen as normal by society. Uh, but yeah, like it, I think that for me, I always have seen in my work that if I kind of give in to what these naysayers are are telling me, then you know I'm never going to get anywhere. So slowly and steadily, for me, it's really important that I bring about this normalization of uh, just doing good. Uh, for for everyone, and uh, we have seen success in that. So uh, I'd say that that that's really good. Oh, I would love to. Like when you said that, uh, we have seen success in it. Like there was a, a lightness, there's a certain tone to that that I would love to just unpack this a bit. Could you mind sharing like a story of yours that like really uh, of, of yours of green hopes that like that really just like lights you up and says like here goes here goes another example of like where we've seen success in this. Yeah, yeah, there is there's so many like in every single one of the projects that we implement the work that we do we see this kind of change, however small it might be and for us. We, we really count those small changes as our biggest successes, I mean we work in certain communities and that are completely ignored by you know the, the local governments by by the national uh, governments and the people that we see most oppressed there are the women and the girls and for us it's really important that our work is targeted towards you know ensuring quality uh, for everyone and when we work with the children in these communities particularly and they're affected by also like literally all of the world's uh, challenges whether that's war whether that's climate change uh, whether that's inequalities uh, but when we work with the children specifically i think that the smile on their faces when you know when they're learning about how they can take care of the planet when they're learning about why they should uh, you know love 
each uh, have love in their heart for each other and kind of just honing that um, inherent empathy and love that all children have. And uh, just when we give them examples of like other children around the world were uh, taking actions uh, for people on planet and the, the light in their eyes, I think that for us is really the biggest uh, success because we see that in the children that we work with literally all around the world, whether it's in an urban or rural area in a like which have any country really. So yeah, I think for us, that's like one example of the success and that when they grow up with literally like we we will be turning 10 years old this year when we they we've seen them how they've progressed and now as either teenagers or at either as adults, they are taking steps in their own zones of influence to bring about change. And I think that's like really, really amazing. So, so yeah. There's, um, as you're talking, my heart is like just lighting up. And I, I actually look for that in these conversations. I'm like, like anything that just engages the brain doesn't necessarily move the conversation forward as much as like the excitement that I feel right down in like it, it, where, where it feels like it's real. Um, and as you're talking about, as I think about some other youth leadership activities that I've, that I've volunteered with and some other programs that have been meaningful. So I just wanna acknowledge and congratulate you and, and congratulate the organization on uh, coming up on the 10 year anniversary of this and creating 10 years worth of, uh, of really uh, kind of like global and local change makers. Um, and to me, I'm just thinking about the impact of like, What's, what's happened over the last 10 years um, and what, where things are going to go in the next 10 years, both through the organization and through every single person who's been directly impacted through the children that are learning, uh, through the resources and the, and the experiences that, that you are creating for them, as well as like the ripple effects of the people that they impact through their work. So I really just want to just make sure that I, like, that I acknowledge that I feel it very, very viscerally in this moment here. And uh, I'm grateful, I'm really grateful that um, you took something that felt super normal to you. And then you like continue to create organization and structure for others to be able to participate and bring it into their lives, bring it into their world uh, at whatever age they happen to be, but I would say at, at quite a young age. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we recognized very early on that starting with like if we kind of instill this love and empathy in children from a very young age, it is, it's, I mean, it's easier just to, because when we grow up, we kind of, the biases that kind of just set in, it's just harder to get rid of those. Although we do work a lot, we work with people of all ages and, you know, it's really important for us to achieve the kind of intergenerational solidarity, but we have seen that starting young is definitely uh, kind of the way forward. So that is why a lot of our programs are focused on working with children. And that's honestly my favorite part. Uh, but yeah, we do work literally with everyone else as well, applying different uh, methods. But because at the end of the day, yeah, just uh, ensuring that people are able to embrace that common humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love to ask this, this question whenever it gets to um a focus on like on youth. I like to look at like, and you're talking about the inter uh, generational solidarity. I would love to just explore that a bit because there was a time where I was thinking, oh, do I go and support the youth? And is that where I want to put my effort into? Because I had had some experiences around that. Or do I go to adults? And, you know, like, honestly, I came to the place of, oh, I feel like, I feel like there are I'll get to a place where if the adults aren't in support, the youth have to work like against, they're like, they're working in resistance uh, along the way. So I'm like, let me go and work a little bit with, with the adults here. I'm really curious here, but I didn't, I didn't look at it from the, the legs. I didn't look to solve the problem or look at the, po I don't, solving problems is one thing, but I didn't look at the possibility of that intergenerational solidarity. So I was wondering if you can like speak a little bit to that and speak to um, like the roles that you see, like I'll put in quote unquote adults. Like I feel like from what I'm hearing from you, it's just like we're one team working like to take care of the planet and people. Um, but like, uh, I'm curious if you can speak to the intergenerational solidarity and, and just, give, just, just give us a little space to explore that. Sure, yeah. You know, like in my field of work, what I have often seen is that when, starting out as a young person we like it's often said that you know the, it's just youth versus adults and like a lot of young people in the field kind of 
uh, demonize the older generations and adults. And you know, I completely understand why that is done because there has been a lot of uh, negative things that have come out of that decisions taken by previous generations, but there have been good decisions too. There have been people in the past generations and our old current, like current older generations who have done a lot of good work, who've dedicated their lives to bringing about change. And it's kind of on their shoulders that we as young people are now, you know, uh, moving ahead with our work. And I think that for, for us, for me, that's really important to understand that. I mean, I saw that kind of intergenerational solidarity again, like right from my childhood where I saw my parents as and my grandparents as these people who did amazing things, who who just dedicated their lives to bringing about uh, change. And, uh, and that is why I knew that, you know, when I heard everyone say that, you know, we it's kind of younger generations versus older generations, I knew that that couldn't just couldn't be as just simple as that there it was very much uh much more complex so yeah for us we recognize that there is good and bad in every generation uh there are definitely a lot of people in our generation who are not uh you know doing good for either people or planet but there are a lot who are doing good and there are a lot of people who are also doing who have done good in the older generations i mean one example that i uh, like to use is that we work a lot with um retirement homes and these are this one example like in uh toronto there's uh this home for who are their nuns and priests who are like activists when they were younger and like just listening to their stories listening to uh how they worked to create a better uh world for uh, that time uh and you know them hearing our stories of advocacy on the ground it's just so amazing we have another uh person uh, whom we work with, uh, he's 92 right now. And he was one of the people, like when he was young and when the United Nations was being formed, uh, he was one of the people who was extremely like anti-nuclear weapons. And he's still active in that. And he he was, uh, he's a former Canadian Senator. He was on our webinar uh, a few days back. And he was like, it's so amazing to see that young people are now taking uh, actions, you know, speaking out against nuclear weapons, you know, with the uh, like a looming nuclear war that's being threatened. So yeah, I think that is kind of where I see intergenerational solidarity. And it's just kind of going from there. So not like vilifying each other and just, it's just really good versus bad in this scenario, not generation versus generation. Yeah, when you, when you say that, I feel like it's like, it's like the greater, the greater good, the bigger picture coming in, into the, into the, into the mix. And, uh, the examples you gave felt really real where it's like in my mind it's like there are people who were youth at, at a point and they were doing things and eventually we'll continue to grow we'll go we'll, we'll have more and more experience so given to the world and being able to kind of continue that that ongoing uh exchange but we're all in this right now working toward uh the greater good that 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 we're looking to accomplish yeah absolutely, absolutely. yeah I, I really I, I I appreciate that there's there's some element of this that's getting me to think about uh getting me to think about this differently as well like and when you said the uh like the word versus um mm -hmm. that's a really powerful word here like like the element of of and I think that a lot of times we try and break things down into a quote unquote simple argument of us mm -hmm. versus them this mm -hmm. versus that black versus white so on and so forth um and so when you when you put in the word versus there um it really just like it 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 shines a light on like on like where where the where the emphasis has been even in my own mind around this and uh i will say that there's new possibilities uh that are opening up right now there's new ways that feel like it, it can it can uh things can come to life so i'm, I'm grateful for that I'm grateful for that so i'm i get curious as, as this goes on here like um, you're now coming into 10 years with Green Hope Foundation. Um, I'll, I may go back a bit to like, like what it was like, actually, you know what I want, I, I'm someone that like looks, tends to look future oriented, uh, and, and as well as present, but I think there's still one more thing I want to capture more, more in like the early days of this. Right. Um, and then I want to see like, where are you at now? Like, what, like, what, like what's being created now? What's, what's, what are some of the focuses now? Yeah. Um, but I, I, to go back to the element of like you know 
you were raised in, in, a, in an environment where this was just normal for you. Um, and at the same time, uh, I wouldn't say that I would immediately think that like a normal thing for a 12 year old to do is to go and build, like start their own organization, you know, um, like, and yet that might have also just been like, obviously this is the, the next logical path to go there. Um, what I would love to just like, exp like explore a bit here is really around the concept of support. Like you can tell me if there's anything that, that comes to mind for, for you in terms of like, um, we spent a lot of time looking at mindset. We spent a lot of time looking into like what's keeping us from being able to like step into basically actualizing the potential that we feel is within us. Um, so if there's anything that feels like real for you around that, I'd like to hear hear some thoughts around it, but I don't need to, we don't need to fabricate anything. If you're just like the next nap, you're like, look, for me, it just made sense. And this was just what we were going to do. Um, I'll, I, have a sec I have a secondary question, but let's, let's start out there first. Sure. So the reason I started an organization is because, as I mentioned, I started my, my individual work when I was seven and I worked on the ground for about five years. And I, I undertook projects on my own of like, you know, uh, neighborhood recycling campaigns, uh, educating, uh, and going to different schools, speaking to uh, them about, well, well, just empathy of uh, understanding of, of equality, all of those things. I did it on my own. And then when I was 11, I was uh, invited to speak at my first United Nations conference. And then the following year, I was at this, the largest uh, sustainable development conference. And then I realized that maybe it's time for me to use that expertise that I had to educate other children as well and educate other people because like I can go do it on my own but if I'm able to also involve others and uh, enable them to like just embrace that change making potential that like I firmly believe everyone has then you know it's kind of just it, it would be just better for everyone involved so yeah that is how I started Green Hope Foundation, I, I invited five of my friends to join and it kind of just, it started really, really small and it just kind of went from there. And honestly, I look back now and even I'm sometimes amazed at like how it just kind of spread from there. And what, what I realized was this, there was this kind of gap that was there in terms of uh, a children bringing about ground level uh, change at the time and, you know, addressing all of these intersectional issues and our work is so so broad like literally we address our issues the issues that we address are across the sustainability spectrum so there was this kind of gap that was there and we kind of we were able to you know come in there and fill that so yeah yeah that's how i that's why i founded uh, green hope foundation and you asked about support i have my parents support like all throughout and i think that's really helped me to continue my journey and you know starting out so young and on top of being a child it was like I was a girl I was a woman and a woman of color and you know that is like I, I faced cyberbullying, death threats stalking threats of physical abuse uh literally like so many uh horrible things but for me that support that the fact that I had the kind of emotional support in my parents and in my Green Hope team as well I think that really helped me to keep going and kind of helped me understand that it was uh, weighing my passion uh, against like my fear of these bullies and my passion always won out. So yeah, that's, that's the support that, and I still have my uh, parents full support. They, like my mom actually works with Green Hope Foundation. So like, yeah, it's just really cool to, to have that uh, kind of thing to help you to move ahead. I think that that support system is something we try to be for a lot of the communities that we work with. Now, as, as you say this here, I think about, uh, thank you for answering both of them. I recognize that like there was a distinction that I had in my mind that wasn't like that, where I was thinking about it wrong. Like you're like, I've been doing this work since I was seven. Like I've been doing the work work of it. Like it's not just volunteering. It's like, I like you, it was you leading and creating and, and you know, galvanizing and mobilizing. Mm -hmm. uh, as one person yeah and then at age 12 you're like what if like what if we can create something so that it, it can be expanded and we can give other people the tools to go out and do this uh as well yeah, yeah. absolutely 
So I just wanted to slow down there and just make sure that I'm like, okay, yeah, let, let me bring, let me get back into like actual alignment with, with what is, what is being created here, what has been created. Um, so that's, that's one element. And then the second part here, um, we talk about like as a child, as a woman and as a woman of color, like going through this and uh, experiencing cyberbullying, death threats, all those things. Like I want to just kind of just put this into a little bit of, I like to time travel a little bit um, as, as I have these conversations because um, I'm meeting you now. We're talking about this in 2022, and you know, there's a there's a social context in the world. There's a social conversation that's taking place uh, at this time here, um, and and there's there's certain things that are like associated with our time right now. But if I go back 10 years ago, and I think about like what was like the environment in 2012 how how much people were talking about this what like what levels of support were out there like it didn't feel like it was a part of the global conversation or like it didn't feel like it was a, like nowadays I feel that there's there's momentum and people are talking about this here but it, it really says something to me it's one of those like kind of slow down and it really says something to me to like to have gotten the support that was necessary to keep moving forward around this here and I I, I want to slow down just a bit on that. We don't need to go too far into it, but um, I know from the people that I work with here that uh, the the we'll have conversations around like I don't want to be a martyr for what it is that I'm doing. Like it's like I believe in it, I believe in it, but I don't know if I'm like if I'm willing to, you know, to receive these threats. You know, I'm not willing. I don't know like. I don't know if it's, if it's worth it. Am I really that person? And like, and and I can see it like in our conversations where there's like a ceiling of like, and there's a ceiling that takes place, and it's almost and it's an imagined, it's a perceived thing. It's like if I actually put out what I thought of in the world, the world will come back at me uh, and try and take me down. So I would love to just spend a little bit of time, if you're okay with this here, just to explore like your experience with this, because I it, it feels like for my for for my outliers, the people I talk to this comes up at some point in it, <laughs> mainly because I'm like, let's get to the thing that really, really, really touches your heart. And when we get there, we run into this here. So do you mind speaking a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. You know, when I started receiving all of these threats, when you know, I had people literally in front of me threatening uh, to kill me, and you know, it was like, and I was so young at that time. so. My, I remember my parents literally having sleepless nights because they'd like they'd be so scared for my safety, uh, and uh, you know if if they saw like slanderous emails coming by the, the cyber bullying, I mean that that they used to like just go through all these messages and just wonder like wh who would do this to a child? Like honestly, why would uh, someone do that? And yeah, I think that. Uh, and I mentioned early that it was kind of my passion versus my fear of these bullies that it was kind of all throughout like what I was uh, facing I kept uh, thinking that you know I just can just as easily stop my work because you know uh, prioritizing my safety uh, but at the same time then I think that but what about all of these other people who who'd kind of be left behind if I myself didn't take that first step because like if I was, when I was seven, I'd attended this lecture by environmentalist Robert Swan, and he'd said the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And I, and I feel that kind of applies to like every situation that we kind of think that someone else is going to take the first step. Like, why should I do it? And, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons why you'd uh, think that, but it's kind of just, I think every person kind of has thought that at some point, and maybe someone else can do it. And it's not safe for me to do that. But for me, it was really important that I took that first step and I take that step every single day because if if not me, then like so maybe someone will, but at the same time, I can inspire others to also take that extra step so that maybe in the future, we can create a future where uh, someone doesn't have to, you know, think that, that, oh my gosh, what about my safety? So yeah, yeah, I think that, uh, my, my parents also like asked me that, are you sure that you want to go ahead? We'll support you no matter what. And I was like, yes, I want to continue my work. And that's why for me, uh, it's so important that at Green Hope Foundation, we create a safe space for everyone because I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. And I know that there's people around the world who've gone through so much worse, are going through so much worse. So we strive to create safe spaces 
in that regard, both like within our organization in the work that we do, uh, whether that's like just really simple steps or like, you know, creating infrastructure. Uh, like for instance, what, just one step that we took is like in a lot of the communities that we work in, we've installed solar street lights so that the women in those communities feel safe to go out of their homes at night. And that is just one physical way that we wanted to create a safe space, but it's also just, you know, uh, being open to everyone, ensuring that every single person understands that, you know, no matter who they are, they can follow their dreams. That's, that's, so yeah, for us and for myself, it's really important to create that safe space and just understand that someone has to take that first step and that I wanted that person to be me so that I could inspire others to do that, do the same as well. Uh, like, thank you for saying that here. Um, and th there's an as you're saying this, there's a quote, and I don't know who brought it to me first, so I have to go back and, and look into who should get attributed to it. Um, but the, gen the general gist of it is like, you are the leader you've been looking for. Mm -hmm. And and when I hear this here, I, I'm I, I, I'm appreciative because it feels like it feels like there was no backing down from the situation that was there. Um, instead, it was getting back into what am I really passionate about and, and the passion, passion in and out. And then there was also like an internal, um, a, a sense of stepping into like an internal, I don't know if it's a responsibility. Don't let me put words in your mouth. So please like, let me know, let me know what the right. I think so. Yeah. Because like it, as human beings, it is kind of, uh, that responsibility that we do have come on this planet to take care of each other, to take care of our planet. So yeah, I, I would def agree with that word responsibility. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, responsibility, I think, is a, is a really powerful word. Like, I think uh, there's the responsibility that we tend to, we, we associate with like the, the true definition of it. Um, and then there's something that uh, like we just break it down, just have a little bit of wordplay with it. Uh, there's responsibility as two different two okay. different elements right uh and what i'm hearing from you is that like you got you gave yourself the space and to be in the, to have the ability to choose how to respond to it not just to react not just to but like to say how do i want to respond um it feels like your response is i'm going to help go help to create more good out in the world uh and and make that make that come to life yeah um, absolutely yeah i i, I want to really acknowledge it i think i think there's uh and there's there's a real there's a real power in, in the element of like if it's not me then it, you said like if it's not me well then someone else would, would create it and to tell you the truth like i hear that and from what i what i've experienced i'm like it is true but like there are some people in the world who will who like will only connect with what it is that you are bringing out into the world yeah. You know, and yeah. I think I think that's that's an important space to like also give give space to. There are other people who are who may be doing like very similar work to you. I, I don't think that you feel alone in the work that you're doing uh, at this point. Do you? Let me just check in on that again. I don't want to. Sometimes, uh, Sometimes it's, yeah, yeah, because like again, as I mentioned, our work is very very broad. So we cover everything from health to. Um, equality to uh, nuclear disarmament to uh, biodiversity conservation planetary uh, conservation to uh, you know uh, ensuring uh, economic social environmental justice so really uh, and decent work economic growth all of that so as a young person working in this field there are a lot of different like certain issues that are kind of we are told that oh it's you shouldn't be addressing that it's not you know, it's not relevant uh, to you or, uh, yeah, or like a lot of the people that we've seen working in the field of sustainability, they often don't address like the intersections of these various issues. And for us at Green Hope Foundation, it's really important that we address that. So uh, it's very easy to kind of just say that, oh, we're just working on this issue. But what we've seen is that, it, like take climate change, for example, like uh, that is, a very big topic right now and a lot of people just focus on on the data sets on like how it's affecting certain community uh, just like oh there's forest fires in uh in canada or in australia but forgetting about the fact that for years on end climate change has been affecting uh communities that are in what our world calls the global south communities that 
are much more vulnerable and are still not being talked about. And amongst uh, and these communities, it's the women and girls, it's people of color, it's liter it's just a lot of people who have been left out and like that is not addressed. So for us, we kind of address those intersections and how like you can't address issues in silos. So in that sense, sometimes we do feel very alone because like when we speak out about it, like a lot of the times the response is not the best because people don't want to acknowledge that. I remember I'd spoken at a huge conference once. Uh, it was about climate change. And uh, afterwards, the person, uh, the head of the organization wrote back to me saying that was really great, but we honestly expected you to speak more about climate change and not poverty. And I, they kind of missed the whole point of my presentation. It was connecting the two and how climate change affects poverty stricken areas much more. So yeah, in that kind of sense, we do feel a bit alone, but we're trying to bring about the change so that we don't, so that people understand why it's so important to address issues in a more holistic manner and less of a silo-based approach. All right, so I think we should like, if you're good with this, I'd love to give some space to part of what you're talking about right now. Like if we use some of the rest of our time here to just give more attention and shine the light on uh, the holistic elements of it all. Uh, mm -hmm. as well as like the intersectionality of like the uh, of the various like causes and the way that everything ties together. I think that climate change uh, and poverty examples and like such a such a wonderful example of like of like they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And if we're not if we're not and if I'm hearing from you, if we're not addressing the interconnected uh, elements of this here, we're missing out on we're missing out on a, on a fundamental component of it. And if we're only thinking about it from, if we're not getting, if, I'm going to say kind of like uh, almost like a mainstream or majority kind of perspective, uh, like we're missing out on like the vulnerable communities uh, out there and the vulnerable people within the most vulnerable people within the most vulnerable communities. And it's, and th there's a lot that, um, and, and they've been dealing with this, not as a, like a, you know, a newsreel, like highlight thing. They're de they've been dealing with it for years. Uh, and the solutions that may be coming up in kind of like you know, the mainstream elements of it all may never actually get down to where where they are actually experiencing right now. Let me again, let me just check in with you. Am I am I in the right kind of realm, yeah. realm right here? Absolutely. Yeah. And we often see that, you know, I always see that our work isn't flashy. It's like real on the ground work. So it's like I mean, it's not safe at times, even like when we go out into these uh, communities and especially for um, our our female members and uh, just people working uh, within the communities. But yeah, like we've often seen that even addressing these big issues, like they kind of select, the world kind of just selects this one uh, one person or one group just to focus on be like, oh, that's what's happening. And that is the solution that should be implemented everywhere. And obviously that's not the case. And I think this, for, this uh, promotion of a one-size-fits-all solution is something that is very very harmful and we've seen that a lot in uh, in like all you know in all of these kind of addressing all of these issues we've seen that uh, very much and that's kind of what we also try to uh, like to address so that it's more localized and we understand that everyone is unique so yeah definitely yeah definitely like <laughs> with you on that there's as you're saying this uh Kakesha, I'm like the it's tying me back to my purpose, right? And my purpose here is to, to champion the leaders who are shaping the next era of humanity. Uh, and I remember when it became real for me. I, I, I grew up on the East Coast in the US, um, lived in New York City for 10 years, did like, you know, high consultant and high tech afterwards. And then I went to go live in Singapore for four years. Um, and during that time, I got a chance to start like traveling throughout Southeast Asia. And I had had a lot of like experiences with leadership. I had seen different things along the way. And I, and I knew, I, I knew what I was about at that point, but there was a moment and it was like, we were driving through Sri Lanka. And I realized in that moment, I was like, no matter like, like as, as much as I want to bring out into the world, as much as I want to serve in the world, I am not the leader for, for like, whatever, whatever needs to happen here. What, and like, and I don't know what it is. I'm not saying like, like there is any, like, but it's like, there's whatever needs to happen here. Like, I'm not that person. 
you know, I'm not, I'm not the right person to, to do that there, but there are, there are people here that are, and how do we help them have the tools? How do we help them step into whatever it is so that for wherever their local world is, and it might we, may it be a country, may it be a block, may it be their home, you know, maybe a relationship with a loved one, right? Wherever that's, that sphere of influence is, like, how do we help make sure that they have what, what's necessary? Uh, um, I'm seeing you nod, so I will want to bring you into this. What's coming up for you? No, you're, you're absolutely right. And and that's, you know, at, at Green Hope Foundation, we kind of call ourselves catalysts. Like, we inspire we empower, we inspire, we engage, uh, educate so that others can also take up those tools themselves to bring about change. And we have a very decentralized uh, kind of system. And uh, honestly, I say, you know, it's like a very feminist leadership structure that we have in the sense that it's not hierarchical. It's really a network and it's very, very uh, decentralized because we understand that like the people who are in those communities who are in those zones, they are the ones who are best suited to bring about change. And that's where we come in as just catalysts to kind of ensure that it goes smoothly, that we're able to provide support. Uh, but yeah, that is, you know, for us, localization in that context is very, very uh, important. And that is why, like, you know, we work in 26 countries. So, and we have like people within those countries if they're like really big or even really small, the communities are different as well. So our members, our chapter heads are the ones who take forward the work, who, uh, who you know, we share best practices, sure. But at the end of the day, they're the ones, since they're experiencing those unique challenges firsthand, they're the ones who uh, take uh, action and we provide uh, the support uh, for that, doing our a bit in that regard. So yeah, it's, it's just really, really important. And for me, I understood that again from a really early age because uh, I was born and raised in Dubai. Uh, my, my grandparents are Indian and I'm Canadian. And I kind of had like these three cultures these three countries kind of make up my identity and what I realized is that people kind of had a very uh like fixed narrative about uh, what I should be or like what a person from these places should be and for me it was like very kind of intersectional and my my situation was unique in that sense so I knew that I couldn't really address uh, anything in my zone of influence if I kind of used someone else's solution that really did not apply to me at all. So yeah, I, and that's when I started Green Hope Foundation it was really important for me that uh, we understood all of these unique uh, challenges within the person, the community, uh, and just going from there. And I often get asked, like, people are like, okay, so what can I do? And it's very difficult for me to answer that because like I don't know your situation I don't know what the unique challenges are so what I can tell you is to educate yourself educate your family educate your community and kind of just go from there see where what expertise you can bring to the table and there's a lot that I think everyone can bring to the table so and just going from there so uh, until and unless I know exactly what's going on or our members know it it's very difficult to answer that but this is like the basic thing that everyone uh, can do to take action. Uh, I really appreciate this here. Um, I'm appreciative of this in, in a number of different ways. You actually articulated when you were talking about the intersectionality and like being able to look, it's, it's almost like something that is unique is yeah. like just at the intersection of all the intersections that no one else, no one else uh, has, you know, uh, and being able to look at it and saying like for, for this, in, there's a specific thing I think it goes back to that element of like, you know, there's a specific thing that you alone may be able to do. And for you, it came out like, like for, for your background, for like the, the, the living, like, like your family, like the time you were born, the, all the things came together to like put together a, a wonderful structure for Green Hope Foundation to start be, coming to life. And that was how you needed, that, that, that was what needed to come out from you at that time, given what was there. Uh, and I really, uh, I hear where, where, where you opened a space for someone to say like, there's something special about you and all of your intersectionalities, the things that is important to you, like spend the time understanding that educate yourself educate others whatever it is and know and like my sense is like it's important whatever it is i don't know what it is 
you like let's help you get to that that place there and then start bringing it out to life and i think that there's um i'm gonna end this I, i'm gonna end this with like just two quick questions and i and one of them one of them came up to mind i'm like i don't think i've ever asked this question but i think i need to going forward um when i think about green hope foundation i, I, I talk to outliers and i've been talking to you as an outlying leader uh and trying to like understand you as an outlying leader like you've also now brought in some things about like green hope foundation i'm like oh this is an outlier like a line organization so I, I like if you had to like describe like what makes your your organization different than others that may be taking things on right now you've spoken to it a lot just now but if you had to put into like a few different words here what would you say like um make like puts this space fits you into the, whatever the outlier container is for you yeah you know for as uh, just to reiterate it's the intersectionality is addressing uh world challenges through a holistic lens and not a silo-based approach and just understanding that every single person, every single community, every single country is unique and we can't use a one-size-fits-all solution. And that is why our solutions are very much localized. Like even if they sound the same or look the same on paper, on the ground, it's very, very different. And we are simultaneously doing all of this work all around uh, the world. So yeah, I think what makes us different and unique in that sense is that as an organization that's primarily led by young people and uh, young women and young women of color, it's like we're addressing all of these uh, intersections, doing uh, like moving away from the one size fits all uh, solution and kind of just enabling people to follow their own unique journey, not just, you know, in this age of social media, it's very easy to look at someone and be like, oh, I have to be exactly that to be an activist, to be an advocate. We, we're all of, we, you don't, we don't adhere to that. We're all about ensuring that people understand that they have their own unique journey. They are unique and therefore their journey must be uh, unique as well. So yeah, just kind of inspiring others to embrace that change-making potential. Thank you for that here. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'd love to hear uh, as we wrap up here, um, any of like the projects or anything like anything that's like exciting you going forward, like when you look at what's coming up next. And then if, if anyone is interested in uh, participating, leading with like volunteering, donating, like whatever it is that, that, that they can do to uh, continue to support what Green Hope Foundation is doing, uh, I'd love to create some space for that too. So if you, can you let us know about both of them? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, whether that's working with us, donating, helping support our work, it's you can all do that through our uh, website, which is greenhopefoundation.com. And uh, yeah, like, there's a lot that I am excited about in terms of our, there are projects that we're working on, on sustainable agriculture, on uh, gender equality, on education, uh, on nuclear disarmament, I think that one thing I'm, which I'm really looking forward to, I wouldn't say excited is the right term because like right now with a kind of looming nuclear uh, threat and war, it's a very sad situation. It's kind of led us uh, to where we are, but really looking forward to the normalization of disarmament education, getting more young people involved uh, in that and not just uh, kind of moving it away from this discussion that only says white men used to have in the past and now just getting more people who are actually affected by awful world challenges involved on the ground and recognizing that leadership so yeah i think that's that's what i'm looking forward to and of course like excited about the fact that there are a lot of children and young people that we're working with who are taking actions on the ground so so yeah well, thank you, Kirk. So let's let's end the conversation here. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Go to greenhopefoundation.com to continue to like support and continue the things going on from there. We'll go on. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kakasha, I just wanted to say thank you once again for being on like, being on the podcast, being like creating this resource, essentially. Um, it's an absolute pleasure getting to know you. And uh, I usually like to leave like five minutes before the end of the, the conversation for us to connect. Uh, but today there was just there, there was just a lot of fire that was <laughs> coming out toward the end. I wanted to uh, to capture that and, and, and have that be able to serve others in the future. Thank you so much for your time uh, here today uh, and also just for your dedication and and like 
determination toward like what it is that you stand for in the world. Uh, this is one of my favorite conversations that we've had uh, to date. Uh, and you'll find with me, I, I think it's part of my style. Um, gratitude and appreciation comes along the ride uh, in these conversations. And so I, I share it in real time um, because there, there are new insights that, that come up. And I'm, I have found that uh, the people that I work with are looking to to think about their world differently and to find find ways to be inspired and to have new insights in the ways that they approach. So I, I like to model that myself. Uh, and at the same time, I'm also just really grateful. I'm grateful for the the things that that you helped me think through um, and just the person that you're being and the organization that you're leading and, and, and beyond. So uh, as this continues on here, uh, I'll let you know in terms of the next steps, uh, Andrea and my team will reach out to let you know about everything related to the to the podcast episode and the resource that we're creating with it. Um, this is a conversation I can see going into many different areas within um, within the Outliers Edge organization to support people uh, and provide them with resources over time. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I'm glad that we're starting out this relationship. Let us know how else we can support. And then uh, you'll be hearing from me in the future about other ways to um, to really support you in the journey. And, and yeah, just just con just continue to be to be a part of uh, the wonderful things that are that are taking place. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Let me know if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, um, if you have any uh, desires at once, like if there's anything that I can, can help, help support you with or support Green Hope Foundation with, uh, let me know. Um, I, I'm, I'm here for you. I think that's I think that's it. Um, and and ultimately, I, like we started talking about, like the uniqueness, the intersectionality uh, and, and approaching things from that lens and uh, actually being one of being one of the only or one of the few uh, as an organization that is taking on uh, some of these challenges. And uh, that's a space that I, I specialize in. So if there's ever a time where you want to have a private conversation uh, that's in support of just you uh, or your organization, let me know. I'm happy to create the time for you. All right. Until then, wishing you all the best. Be well. Ready to play at your edge? Come join us inside of the Outliers Edge Multiverse, where you have the opportunity to come for 14 days and play in the sandbox of your unique leadership style and take everything about you to its next edge. Go to Outliers Edge slash OE Guest Pass in order to receive your two-week gift.